Welcome and happy Giving Tuesday. Today is a day to celebrate generosity and giving, and we are grateful for the support you show, show our organization, whether that's through volunteering in some way, through participation in sessions like this, or through charitable gifts, you truly make a difference. Thank you for choosing to spend some of your time with us this afternoon. This Facebook Live is our way of giving back to you, and we hope you get a lot out of it. I am Melissa Bombick with the ANA, and I'll be your moderator today. We're excited to welcome Dr. Jay Piccarillo from Washington University in St. Louis School of Medicine, and our topic is tinnitus in patients with acoustic neuroma. Before we get started, I have just a few items to note. If you have questions during the presentation, you can type them in the comments section, and we'll get to as many as we can after Dr. Piccarello is done presenting. There are live captions available, and you should be able to see them now. We are recording today's presentation, and we'll have it uploaded to the ANA video library later this week. We'll also have permanent captions added, which takes about a week. Those will appear on the recording once they're available. The Acoustic Neuroma Association is the premier resource for the AN community. We inform, educate, and support people affected by acoustic neuroma, and it's our vision to continually improve the lives of patients and their families through communication, support, innovation, and partnerships with the medical community. Our thanks to all of our annual sponsors whose support and partnership help advance acoustic neuroma education as well as increase awareness. Now I'd like to introduce our speaker. Dr. Piccarillo is a professor on the investigator track of otolaryngology, medicine, biostatistics, and occupational therapy at Washington University in St. Louis School of Medicine and vice chair for research and director of the Clinical Outcomes Research Office for the Department of Otolaryngology Head and Neck. He is a general otolaryngologist and editor-in-chief of the Journal of the American Medical Association's Otolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery and on the JAMA editorial board. Currently, his research focuses on tinnitus and COVID-associated anosmia. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and the camera on. And Dr. Piccarillo, you can go ahead. Thank you very much, Melissa, for that introduction. It's a real pleasure to be here today to talk about tinnitus and acoustic neuroma patients. Um, most of this all looks good, my slide? Yep, looks great. great. Okay, so um, I have no uh, disclosures, nothing to discuss today uh, with a conflict of interest or anything. I'd like to introduce uh, the research team, both the outcomes research people shown here, my behavioral therapy colleagues and my neuroimaging colleagues. It's, it's truly a team effort, the data and, and the thoughts that I'll present today uh, during this webinar. I also have grant support that I like to acknowledge. So this webinar will focus on the relationship between acoustic neuroma and tinnitus treatments and prognosis. Tinnitus is a very common symptom in adults. Nearly 50 to 60 million Americans are affected. 75% fortunately say they're not bothered, but about 25% say they are bothered by their tinnitus. And 16 million will seek medical opinions. Along with hearing loss, tinnitus is a most frequently reported disability among military veterans. Tinnitus is one of the most common symptoms in acoustic neuroma patients and can present before or after surgery. One study found that tinnitus is present on average in about 68 out of every 100 or about two thirds of acoustic neuroma patients at presentation. 10 in every 100 acoustic neuroma patients present with tinnitus as the main symptom of their acoustic neuroma. Among 100 acoustic neuroma patients who undergo surgery, tinnitus is present on average in about 60 to 61 and 40 of them experience continued tinnitus after surgery. And finally, among the 39 patients who do not present with tinnitus before surgery, eight of them will develop tinnitus after surgery. If hearing preserving surgery is performed, there is a chance that tinnitus can be eliminated or prevented. There are three surgeries that can be performed for an acoustic neuroma, and the surgical technique that preserves hearing is called the retrosigmoid approach. If hearing preserving surgery is performed, about 60 out of every 100 patients that had tinnitus before surgery 
can expect their tinnitus to disappear. However, it's also been shown that tinnitus can start as a brand new symptom after surgery in about 14 of every 100 patients who undergo this retrosigmoid approach. And interesting, there's no relationship between tumor size, age, and gender of the acoustic neuroma patients and association with tinnitus. I'd like to switch a little bit and just talk about tinnitus in general, not so much related to acoustic neuroma, but sort of in general. So the causes of tinnitus are varied, but all seem to include a shift in the dynamic balance of neural activity between the cochlea and various brain networks as seen in resting state functional connectivity MRI images, which I'll spend a little bit of time of, ex of explaining shortly. So um, we believe that altered sensory input from the ear um, can affect auditory pathways and can lead to tinnitus. We also believe that pre-existing abnormalities within one or more of these neural networks in the brain, then I'll talk about briefly uh, in a minute, can lead to tinnitus also. So tinnitus is associated with a variety of neurological impairments. Tinnitus sufferers have poor working memory, slower processing speeds and reaction times, and deficiencies in selective attention. Deficits in verbal learning, auditory attention, and phenomic verbal frequency that depend on attentional resources have been identified. Bothersome tinnitus is associated with a variety of deficits, symptoms and conditions such as deficits in attention, cognitive efficiency, the ability to think quickly, working memory to uh, remember things, uh, uh, remember what it is you're supposed to buy at the supermarket, uh, can lead to sleep disturbances and depression. And all of these findings suggest or indicate that tinnitus interferes with our ability to attention and to uh, pay attention and to focus or to redirect our attention. So neurobiology is a specific area of tinnitus research that tries to explain why most people with tinnitus are not bothered while others are. And why are bothered tinnitus patients bothered in non-audiological or ways that aren't necessarily related to the ear? And I think the real answer for so many of us tinnitus researchers is this whole area of neuroimaging research. And this is performed with magnetic resonant imaging or MRIs and is based on this concept of blood oxygenated level dependence. And what that means is, is that oxygenated and deoxygenated blood produce different MRI signals. So the MRI works in a lot of ways like a microwave does. A microwave rotates the water molecules in such a way that it creates heat. And in a similar way, the MRI signals pick up the different uh, oxygenated and deoxygenated signals that come from blood. So oxygenated blood, of course, comes from the heart, feeds the tissue, and then deoxygenated blood leaves. Well, the brain is the largest blood using organ in our body. And there's a lot of blood flow through there. And the MRI uses that to um, help us understand what is happening. And so this difference between oxygenated and deoxygenated blood at rest allows us for the study of brain activity in a way that's called resting state functional connectivity MRI. It analyzes the way that different parts of the brain are connected or wired like, like a network, almost like uh, telephone networks, and the way the country is, is wired by um, uh, interstate highways, or the way airline routes are networked across the country with hubs being major cities. So spontaneous bold activity examines the brain at rest, and it looks for relationships as markers for these connected regions. I have a little animation below that illustrates um, a particular method called the seed method that allows us to study these blood oxygen dependent fluctuations. So the bold signal is something like this. This is the brain at rest and different areas of the brain are lighting up with different activities. The investigator then wants to know 
what areas of the brain are using oxygen at the same frequency, the same way as the seed region, say like the, the cochlea or the auditory region, or maybe in our case, the attention network, what other areas are tied in? And then it identifies these correlations through the blood oxygen level. And that's resting state functional connectivity. And it really opened up the ability to study conditions like tinnitus. Let me give you an example. Here we see two brain regions, the ipsilateral parietal sulcus, it's just a brain area, and then the frontal eye field shown here. And it shows the connection, the correlation, if you will, a multiple, each one of these red dots is a person, and it shows the blood oxygen signal between these two areas of the brain. And because there's a, a strong correlation, we say that they are related, they are communicating to each other. Um, when one area gets busy, the other area gets busy. And we quantify that by a statistic called a correlation coefficient. And that's, that's as much math as we'll get in today. So don't worry, but we're looking at correlations. And then what we do is we look at, again, correlations between different areas of the brain. And here we have something called the posterior cingulate gyrus, an area of the brain related to attention and focus. And it's shown right here. And then these various colors show other areas of the brain as they relate to the posterior cingulate gyrus. And dark colors like blue are inverse correlations. That is when the cingulate gyrus gets busy and uses lots of oxygen, these other areas are going to sleep. They're inversely related. Whereas the warm areas like the orange and the yellows, they are positively correlated. They get active at the same time that the posterior cingulate gyrus gets activated. And so we then say that these areas are positively correlated. And neuroimaging research in bothered tinnitus patients allowed us to identify significant abnormalities in various neural networks, including the attention networks. That means the, the networks that are responsible for us paying attention like today on this webinar. But if my beeper went off, uh, hopefully not, but if the beeper went off, I would automatically turn my attention to the beeper. And if your phone goes off or your doorbell rings, you would turn your attention from this webinar to the, to the doorbell. So that's, those are, functions of the attention network. We also have something called the executive control network that allows us to help make decisions and the cognitive networks and something called somatosensory. Somat means body, how we feel our body, like pain receptors, muscle receptors, things like that. The visual networks, the auditory networks, and uh, the memory networks in patients with bothersome tinnitus. And so we were able to see abnormalities in these network connectivity that were not observed in people with non-bothersome tinnitus. So these are people with tinnitus, but they're not bothered. Same age group, same hearing loss, but their attention networks are wired just perfectly fine. They're connected in a way that is like normal people, even though they have tinnitus. So that led us to conclude that the bother that 20% or so of people with tinnitus experience is related to disruptions in one or more of these types of networks that really have nothing to do with hearing or the ear, quite frankly. So let me show you what I'm talking about here. This is functional connectivity MRI of the auditory network connectivity. And these are control subjects. These are brains of people without tinnitus. And you see the um, the seed, if you will, is in what's called the auditory, the left auditory center. And these colors represent, as I mentioned before, areas of the brain that are either in warm colors, positively correlated above what would be expected just by random chance. And the cool blue areas are negatively correlated. So there's correlations between the auditory areas and frontal areas and visual areas and different areas of the brain. This is what a tinnitus patient's brain connectivity looks like. And what I'd like you to, you know, just take a look and see if you can identify two areas, well, uh, four areas, but two areas in particular that are different between the control brains and the tinnitus brains. And one area, pretty obvious, is right here. And these are what are called the posterolateral frontal areas, like the attention area. And so this 
is positively correlated with the auditory center in tinnitus patients, but there's no relationship really, maybe a little bit in controls, but this is quite a bit different in tinnitus patients. And then the second area that's different is this really deep blue that's a cool area. It's a negative correlation between the auditory area and this is the visual center. So in tinnitus patients, the auditory center and the visual center are negatively correlated. My neurobiologist asked me, Jay, do your tinnitus patients say that their tinnitus gets worse when they close their eyes? And I said, well, yes, Harold. At night when they sleep, they all say it gets worse. But I thought that was because of no more masking or sound. He said, well, it may be, or it may be this inverse relationship between the auditory and the visual centers. So the bother of bothersome tinnitus is due in our, in our research to disruptions and abnormalities associated with these key cortical networks. And as a result of these findings from neuroimaging and other various brain electrical signal research like EEG research, the focus of tinnitus research has really shifted over the last 10, 15 years from the ear to the central nervous system or the brain. And this top-down attention system, which is composed of different subunits, and in particular, the frontoparietal and the dorsal lateral really seem to be involved in tinnitus. And as a result of this recognition that the brain is not functioning properly, many of us have begun to think about neuroplasticity, that is the ability of the brain to change itself as a treatment for bothersome tinnitus. What can we do? What exercises, what interventions can we do to help the brain to get back to a more normal situation so that it can deal with those disruptions in the attention network and somatosensory network and those various brain networks that seem to not be functioning properly in people with the bothersome tinnitus. So what are some of the different treatments that we've tried? And I'm not gonna go into each of them today. We don't have enough time. I will focus briefly on one of them, but we've looked at tinnitus retraining therapy, which has been around for a long time to help people to kind of retrain or to refocus by putting maskers, tinnitus maskers in their ear. We also did a, a research program of computer-based cognitive rehab training program. So it's about 20 minutes a day that tinnitus patients would sit at their computer and do uh, brain games, if you will, brain training games. Um, we've also did a research project of mindfulness-based stress reduction. It's a type of meditation I'll speak about shortly. And then also we look, we are currently doing research looking at cognitive behavioral therapy as treatment for bothersome tinnitus. I'm not gonna talk any more about tinnitus retraining therapy. It's not very effective for tinnitus. Our computer-based cognitive rehab training programs were not shown to be very effective either. Mindfulness is very effective. Let me spend a minute or two talking about what mindfulness is. Mindfulness is a meditation and yoga program. It focuses on facing, exploring, and relieving the suffering, in this case, from the bothersome tinnitus. MBSR has been associated with improvement in neural conductivity changes in healthy patients and in many, many disease states. Uh, I don't wanna say hundreds, but almost every single disease condition where mindfulness has been examined, it's been found to be very effective. Here is a wonderful training book for those of you who might be interested. Mindful, Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction Workbook. Um, John Kabat-Zinn is the uh, person who modified original uh, Hindu type meditation to an American Western population. So the study that we did, our hypothesis was, is that mindfulness-based stress reduction can alter the attention networks and improve symptoms in bothersome tinnitus patients. And so we looked at the impact of eight weeks of MBSR on both the bother that people experience and the neural conductivity. And again, in the interest of time, I'm just gonna to get to the summary and not go through all the methods and results, but we were able to show significant improvement in behavioral tinnitus scores and maintained, as a matter of fact, actually improved six months later. We were able to show increased connectivity in neural attention networks following mindfulness. In other words, the attention network was wired more uh, properly, connected better to the various areas of the brain that it's supposed to be connected to. Uh, we saw no differences in some other areas of the brain, I, a little too technical, 
Um, and so the implications are that mindfulness is a treatment is associated with connectivity changes and attention networks that appear to co-occur with and are associated with people feeling better. It's inexpensive, it's non-invasive, and it's really a promising therapy for bothered tinnitus patients. And so to sort of conclude, um, we believe that the, um, the, the tinnitus is a very common problem for everybody. It, it probably is related to the acoustic neuroma tumor for some people, but not everybody. Um, some people with acoustic neuroma tumors can develop tinnitus afterwards. Some people with tinnitus before can get relief after. It's, it's really quite variable. We believe that the abnormal neural networks are associated with the bother of tinnitus, and that these networks, again, attention, somatosensory, and the emotional networks. There's no question stress and anxiety play significant roles in tinnitus bother. And finally, effective treatments are those treatments that exploit neuroplasticity, the ability of the brain to change itself and strengthen connectivity with and across networks to make us more resilient and able to deal with the bother from tinnitus. So the effective treatments help deal with the stress and redirect the attentional focus away from the tinnitus percept. Almost every single one of my patients that does the mindfulness course tells me the same thing after their eight weeks. Thank you so much for sponsoring this class. The mindfulness helps me uh, with my tinnitus and they all put their fingers in their ears and they look to the floor, they look to the ceiling, and then it's as if they find the tinnitus and they say, I can still find my tinnitus, but it just doesn't bother me like it used to. And oh, by the way, doc, the mindfulness helps me with all the other stress in my life. So it's really just a very holistic approach. Well, that, that ends my formal presentation. I'd love to take questions or answer anything you might have about tinnitus in particular. To, to amplify what Melissa said, I am a general otolaryngologist. I specialize in a variety of things, including tinnitus. I do not see acoustic neuroma patients professionally, so I, I'd really rather not get specific questions about you know, tumors and treatments and therapy. It's, it's possible. That so makes thank sense. Thank you. Thank you, um, Dr. Picarello. That was a great presentation. If you want to go ahead and stop um, sharing your screen, then um, we can go back and forth with some questions. Great. Can you talk a little bit about pulsatile um, tinnitus and um, how it's different from um, what you talked about? We had um, some questions about patients that had um, felt like they had that with eye movement or even with head movement. Sure. So um, I'll, I'll do pulsatile tinnitus first. So pulsatile tinnitus, the word pulsatile means beating, and it can be usually from a heartbeat. Um, so pulsatile tinnitus is different than subjective tinnitus, or like Melissa said, what I've been talking about. Um, patients with pulsatile tinnitus uh, hear the sound almost like with their heartbeat. And while the vast, vast majority of these pulsatile tinnitus patients don't have any cardiac or vascular abnormalities, a very small percentage of them can have small aneurysms or little ballooning out of the blood vessels in the brainstem where the acoustic nerve is and where the cochlea is. And so it's thought that that small aneurysm is what accounts for the pulsatile sensation. But I wanna, has, I wanna state again, Overwhelmingly, like in my clinical experience, 95 out of 100 pulsatile tinnitus patients have absolutely nothing wrong in the brain. There's no aneurysm, there's nothing. It's just, they, they experience their tinnitus as sort of a beating sound. But for us otolaryngologists, it is a little bit of a warning sign. And we'll, we'll usually get some imaging studies just to make sure. Uh, Melissa, you asked about uh, people who can modulate their tinnitus by moving their eyes, clenching their jaws. Yeah, that's a fascinating uh, condition. It's, it's real. It's true. We actually imaged a bunch of people who can modify their tinnitus by various facial movements. So we have uh, a woman, she moves her eyes to the right, the tinnitus volume goes up. She moves her eyes to the left, the tinnitus goes away. Patients who clench their jaw can bring on their tinnitus a variety of different facial motions. And so we, um, we did an MRI study. Could we see any changes in neural connectivity when the tinnitus is on versus when it's off? So imagine if you will, for those, I guess all of you have had MRI imaging, you know what that's like to sit in the MRI gantry 
and to have the technician, you know, radio in. <sighs> okay, uh, go ahead and you know turn your eyes to the right. Don't and then don't move your head. Just move your eyes. And then click, 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 click. We take a bunch of images. Okay, relax. Now move your eyes to the left. Click, 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 click. A bunch of images. Um, so it was challenging technically to get people to make the motion without moving their head too much. And in the end, as I said, we weren't able to demonstrate anything different. Interesting. Okay. Um, is we had a question about and this was early in the presentation, so you may have kind of gone over it a little bit, but. Um, the question was, what is the threshold for bothersome tinnitus? And so then, you know, just to speak to that, why is it that some patients are bothered by it and others are not? Is it physical or what is that? Yeah. How does that work? So we use the term bothersome or non-bothersome to describe the ways in which tinnitus interferes with people's ability to go about their life, their physical capabilities, listening, inter uh, communicating with people functional aspects, enjoying life, um, sleeping, things like that. And so, um, you know, we don't really have a hard, fast definition of what bothered means and not bothered. Um, I love to tell the story of a gentleman about my age who came into my office for a nose problem, and he saw an advertisement for some tinnitus research project that we had going on at the time. And so after I got done taking care of his nose problem, he asked me about the tinnitus research. And and what was tinnitus? I said, oh, it's ringing, clicking, clanging, you know, an auditory percept. Oh, I've got that. Can I be in your study? And in order to be in my study, I need to know if he's bothered or not. Because except if we're looking for controls, really all of our research involves people who are bothered by their tinnitus. So I asked him, I said, are you bothered? And he didn't skip a beat. He looked at me and said, no, why would I be? Uh -huh. And, I, and that's sort of like, he had no concept of why someone would be bothered. So I generally don't have to, I don't have to tell people what it means to be bothered. They, you know, they tell me, mm -hmm. it won't go away. It's always there. It's very loud. Now, one thing that's very interesting, you might ask, I think you did, Melissa, you know, why are some people bothered and other people are bothered? Mm -hmm. well, I have my, my um, thoughts about that. And I'll share it with you. Side. But one thing that probably doesn't explain it is the auditory perception. In other words, when you take people with tinnitus who are not bothered and put them in a soundproof booth and ask them to turn the volume up on the sound in the soundproof booth to match the perceived level of loudness of their tinnitus, and you ask a bunch of people with non-bothersome tinnitus to do that, and then you ask a bunch of people with bothersome tinnitus to do the same thing, which group on average has the loudest tinnitus? They're the same. Really? So it's not that it's a click versus a clack or a buzz versus a hum or both ears versus one ear. It's the patient's reaction to the tinnitus that defines their experience and in particular how bothered they are. Mm -hmm. So, you know, um, we all experience bad things in our lives. It's how we react to it that defines us. And so in a similar way, 50, 60, 70 million Americans have tinnitus. Three quarters of them aren't bothered. Right. Now, I'm fascinated why that is. And I believe it has to do with the way they're wired. That some people are wired in a way that's very resilient. They just don't focus on it. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, it's there. Right. It doesn't bother me. Why would it? And then the very next patient says, oh my gosh, doc, it just won't go away. It's always there. But it's not like it's any louder. It's their right. reaction to it. And we believe the reaction to it is defined by the neural networks. And the neural networks are defined by the genetics. In other words, how we are hardwired at birth, you know, uh -huh. the genetics, how we come out of the factory, our right. factory presets. And then our experience in life. So many people have very, very traumatic childhoods or very traumatic time. And that, that may wire them in such a way that makes them more vulnerable. Okay. Other people, they have no idea why anyone would be bothered. They just move right along and enjoy life and they're as happy yep. as a clam. Yep. So I, that's sort of my working idea. It's the way we're wired. And okay. if that's true, I love to tell the second part of the story, which is, and that means you have the power to do something about it because we absolutely can change the way our brain is wired. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously people who have had surgery or the brain has been injured by something traumatic. Sure. 
you know, there's only so many, so much limits, but the brain is very plastic. It can, even at my age, even at older age groups, it can change and it's beautiful. Okay. One, we have a question from somebody who um, I don't think is, it would, I think would even say is not bothered by uh, her tinnitus. Um, she says, in fact, it doesn't really bother me, but she does have trouble um, following complicated plot lines in movies and books and um, isn't able to draw perspective. And that kind of does bother her. Um, I never thought much about the tinnitus. So is that something that can be, um, I know you mentioned it in your presentation that that can um, happen. Is that something that can be adjusted or overcome with therapy or something like that? Yeah. So um, that's what we noticed in some of our earlier research where we had our bothersome tinnitus patients complete a, a whole battery, like an hour and a half of complex neuropsychological tests, you know, a draw, draw a line, draw a clock, find the animals, remember four items, you know, we'll ask you again in 30 minutes. I mean, those kind of horrible psychological tests and stuff. And mm -hmm. in any event, um, I asked our psychologist who's administering these tests, generally in older demented patients, I said, hey, Kathy, what's your perspective on the tinnitus patients? In what way are they similar? In what way are they different from the other patients that you've done testing on professionally? And she said, Dr. Piccarello, what's really interesting about the tinnitus patients is they get the right answer, but the way they get it is rather strange. It's almost as if they have all these workarounds in their brain to get to the right answer. And as a result, it's kind of time consuming and very laborious for them, very tiresome for them. They get it, but it's just very hard. And so um, that kind of a, alludes to this brain not being connected properly. And they have to do a bunch of workarounds to get to the answer. And with that in mind, that's how, why we did the brain training program, because there are like luminosity and we worked with um, uh, brain fitness program and I'm not endorsing any one program, but I'm sure your, your audience has heard of these type of brain training, brain games. Mm -hmm. And the idea was, could people do more than just crossword puzzles to train their brain? And the answer is maybe, but we, we didn't really see that. We, of course, we had some patients who said, oh my gosh, Dr. Piccolo, that was great doing the brain training program, 30 minutes a day for eight weeks. I really feel like I can remember things better. I can put my thoughts. Through. And that was sort of what we were expecting. But at the end of the day, when we had a control group and we had enough patients, we just didn't really see much of an effect. So the mm -hmm. answer specifically to your patient's question would be, you know, get lots of sleep, get lots of sleep, and just try to be conscious and mindful about remembering things and focusing on things. And as we get older, that's, that's important for everybody. Right. But you believe that the tinnitus patient with that tinnitus scramble, it can lead to some of the symptoms that she's describing. And quite frankly, before my neuroimaging colleague called me with the results of these neuroimaging studies and the dramatic disruption in these brains, I couldn't understand why the tinnitus patients would be complaining about forgetting things and not remembering what they're doing, all these cognitive issues. And I was like, can you just tell me if it's a click or a clack? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I wanted to focus on the tinnitus. Right. And yet my patients were telling me, it's really not the click, doc, it's, it's the cognitive issues. And yeah. once I started seeing these images from the brain and the connectivity problems, I had my big aha moment. That's why these people get confused at the grocery store or they, they can't follow directions because they're trying to get things to work and they're just not connected right. Right. When you talk about the ringing and you talk about the click and the clack, um, we have patients who um, wonder if tinnitus would include the perception of spoken words or dialogue, music. Someone even said that they can hear it when someone touches their back. So mm -hmm. would that be considered tinnitus as well? That's fascinating. Um, so I think technically hearing voices and stuff would not be considered tinnitus. But, you know, I, I collaborate a lot with psychiatrists and psychologists, and we always kind of kick that around, you know, so why is it that voices aren't a form of tinnitus or, or tinnitus is a form of a very primitive type of auditory hallucination? Uh -huh. So um, I don't quite know how to answer that question, except to say that I think it's, yeah, I think in some way or another, the brain is play, playing a trick. And so instead of hearing a click or a clack, it's kind of voices or something like that. I, you know, I wouldn't be worried. I'm not, you know, scared or anything like that, but it is an interesting observation. Yeah. Um, we um, generally associate tinnitus with some level of hearing loss. Um, 
sometimes, not always. Um, someone was talking about having had radiation and, um, and surgery, I believe, uh, after an acoustic neuroma and didn't have tinnitus, um, but was standing on a street corner when, when an ambulance went by with the siren blaring. And then it kind of started. Is, is our loud noises something that can kind of kick that off? Absolutely. Um, so that's generally the, the classic inciting event, loud noise exposure, either like military shooting guns or rock concert, mm -hmm. or in this case, you know, a loud siren going by. Um, but in my own practice, I'd say only about maybe 40 to 50% of people can identify loud noise. The other 50 or 60% say, I have no idea, doc. I just woke up and it was there. So I don't know what that relationship is. I don't think it's I don't think it's in doubt that trauma or injury to the ear can subsequently result in tinnitus. But many, many people have injuries to the ear and no tinnitus. Mm -hmm. Lots of people have tinnitus who can't describe any injury to their ear, just like your own acoustic neuroma patient. Yep. Some of them after, I mean, what bigger insult you know, to the brain could be acoustic neuroma surgery? And so many of them don't have, but some do. And right. I, you know, some of our cochlear implant patients who have tinnitus before the cochlear implant will get resolution of their tinnitus, not with the implant in, but with the implant in and turned on. And so when the implant is in, but turned off, mm -hmm. their tinnitus comes back. And when, the, and when the implant gets turned on, it gets gone, but that's not everybody. So yeah. you know, some people, some people with hearing, bad hearing loss and tinnitus say, hey, should I just get an implant and that'll take care of my tinnitus? And again, that's a little bit out of my league. I'm not an auto, you know, neuro-otologist, but I say right. there's no guarantee. With tinnitus, there's no guarantee. And, you know, I, I hate to, you know, talk about it this way, but way back when, I do know that some patients who are so bothered by their tinnitus would have the auditory nerve severed or cut in hopes that that would stop the noise because after all, it's obviously coming from the ear, right, doctor? Right. It's, it's right here. I can hear it. The nerve was cut and the tinnitus didn't change. And if that's not evidence that the tinnitus is coming from the brain and not the ear, I don't know what else is. Yes. So, you know, putting a cochlear implant in should be for hearing, not to treat the tinnitus, which is, which is what I talk about with my patients with hearing loss and tinnitus. I say, you know, if you're thinking about getting a hearing aid, that's fine, but make sure you're getting a hearing aid for your hearing loss. Mm -hmm. It may help with your tinnitus, or it may not. It may not. Yeah, don't get the hearing aid for tinnitus alone. Mm -hmm. And I know that isn't your area of expertise, but we did have a question about cochlear implants and tinnitus. And um, I think that's fantastic advice because the question talks about using cochlear implantation for treating incapacitating tinnitus um, in patients with signal, single-sided deafness. But can you talk at all about um, cochlear implants versus other kinds of hearing aids and your experience, I guess, with patients, have they seen improvement in, um, with that or is it just sort of? Yeah, Melissa, it's unfortunate. In my experience, it's kind of random. You know, uh, both of the cochlear implants and the uh, hearing aids. In no case is it uh, proven that, you know, getting the hearing aid or getting the implant well, take care of my tinnitus. And anybody who goes into it with that is just kidding themselves. And it's mm -hmm. even possible that it can make it worse. Yeah. But that's, it kind of gets back to what I'm, I hope, hope I'll leave with your audience, which is, again, it's not really in the ear. Mm -hmm. All of us, including myself, I have tinnitus. We all need to adapt to the tinnitus and just not be so bothered by it. And, and I know that sounds easy to say, and it is easy for me to say it. And for most people, it's easy to do, but not everybody. And that's where the behavioral therapies come in. So before jumping to a cochlear implant, I would make sure that I've been trying some real good behavioral therapies, because I think that's gonna get everybody to a much better place, much safer and quicker than some type of cochlear implant or other intervention. Mm -hmm. Do you, this also might not be your area of, of expertise, but um, if, if a patient has a ringing tone and then they start hearing um, higher volume or different sounds, does that indicate anything? Is hearing getting worse? Is there additional damage or anything like that? Great question. But, you know, in my 25 years of experience, I can't make heads nor tails of those kind of stories. Uh -huh. I just don't know what it means. 
makes sense. Um, and how many, I don't know if you see patients after they've had radiation to treat their acoustic neuroma. We have a couple questions about um, cyber knife or, or different kinds of radiation that are, that's used to treat acoustic neuroma and what your experience has been as far as resolution of tinnitus after that. I don't have enough experience unless I saw, I'll hesitate to give an answer specifically, but once again, in my experience about tinnitus in general, there's just a lot of randomness to it. And mm -hmm. I don't think any, you know, as far as my searching of the literature and preparing for today's webinar, you know, there's no one treatment that's highly associated with either increasing in tinnitus or resolution of tinnitus, quite frankly. That makes sense. Okay. How about COVID? Um, vaccines and boosters, we've had questions um, about those and that there have been patients with um, increased tinnitus following their um, vaccine or their booster. And just wondering if that's something that you're seeing commonly or if it's just here and there. Yeah, I think it's, we are seeing it commonly. Um, once again, I don't know what to make of it and I'm very hesitant to, to ascribe a cause effect. Mm -hmm. So as I mentioned, stress and anxiety plays a huge part in tinnitus, both its development and its exacerbation or making it worse. And the number of people who come to my office and talk about how all of these symptoms began around March of 2020, mm -hmm. uh -huh, or after my COVID infection or after my second dose, I don't know what to make of it because I don't have a denominator. I just get people who show up in my office. And as an editor of one of our major journals, you know, I do have the opportunity to review manuscripts like um, from the, you know, the country of Israel where they got three or 4 million people and they're studying these things at a much larger level with a, a numerator and denominator so they can really make some estimates. It doesn't appear that there's any relationship. So, mm -hmm. you know, there's no doubt that for some people, yeah, I believe them right after their second dose, their tinnitus got worse or they didn't, uh -huh. never had tinnitus until COVID. Uh, but I'm not sure that's really that much more than what I see in an average week before COVID. Right, right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what about some of these over-the-counter and, um, you know, things you see on TV or hear about that are supposed to be tinnitus online, I guess, tinnitus cures? How are there any of those that are effective? So let, let me let me take this opportunity to tell some fun stories about this. So um, okay. the question was, um, or let me rephrase the question. Um, I saw advertised on late night cable TV, a cure for tinnitus. And boy, oh boy, the person sounded really honest about it. Like, shouldn't I get that product? And the answer would be no. I mean, the answer is, you know, do what you want. But I, I think that's really wasting your money. And the reason I say that is as follows. Through my research over the years, I've had several trials where we've had placebos. Mm -hmm. That is either a drug that was just a starch pill or our transcranial magnetic stimulation study where we had magnets placed on the patient's head to stimulate the cortex in, a, in an attempt to reorganize the brain in a more favorable way to treat their tinnitus. So, I would debrief the people after the trial. And in the gabapentin trial, we had 55 people who got gabapentin. With, these were all bothersome tinnitus patients. And mm -hmm. then we had 55 people that got placebo. And I remember very clearly two gentlemen about my age who said, you know, doc, right after I started, my tinnitus went away. It's been wonderful. And in fact, they were on the gabapentin arm. Now, two out of 55. The other 53 said, nah, I didn't notice any change. I had a little upset stomach. I got a little dizzy, but my tinnitus is the same. Uh -huh. And then I got a couple of people on the placebo arm who are as rational as you and me and everybody that's watching this, as rational as we are, talk about how much better they felt after being on this trial. And when I opened up the envelope and read what assignment they got and told them it was placebo, they didn't skip a beat and said, that's okay. I want more. And the same thing with the magnet trial. I had a woman as rational as you, Melissa, and it was a crossover trial. So they'd get randomized to get real magnet or placebo two weeks on, two weeks off, and then cross over to the other assignment, either real magnet or placebo. And she talked about how she loved magnet A and it helped her with this and with that. And you know, it was okay for the tinnitus, but, but then magnet B really helped her with the tinnitus. And I said, well, 
you know, do you want magnet B? No, I want magnet A. That actually made me feel even better. And when I opened up the envelope on her, magnet A was the placebo. And she said, that's okay. I'd much rather have the placebo. So what my research has shown me is that tinnitus, like many conditions, have a very strong placebo effect. Mm -hmm. And upwards of 30 to 35% of people will have absolute resolution of their tinnitus. They're not lying. They're not making up. They're just not, it's just not very more. Yeah. And why is that? It's because the neuroplasticity of the brain. It just changed. And I mean, the same way that it comes on suddenly. I, I don't yeah. know. People, people yeah. always ask me, why did I get this? And we always look for something that happened just before, because that's how we identify patterns. That's how the human brain works. What happened just before that could reasonably be the, the cause of your tinnitus. Mm -hmm. As I said, for half the patients, it's nothing. For a large number, it's stress like COVID, losing your job, losing your loved one, those type of stressful. So in any event, with that said, I have a number of experiences where placebos alone can, can relieve people of their tinnitus. And if that's true, then that makes me understand how these behavioral therapies work and these mindfulness, just training yourself to not be so focused on it, to just move on. As one of my patients said, when I asked him, he was so bothered by his tinnitus. A year later, he came back and for a nose problem. And after the nose problem was taken care of, I asked him about his tinnitus and he said, well, it's just not bothering me. And I, I got my pen out and all ready to, to take his wisdom about an 80 year old gentleman. And I said, well, tell me what you did so I can share it with others. Cause I see a lot of people with tinnitus. And he said, I just decided to move on. Yeah, just to, wait a minute, what does that mean? And he said, look, doc, at my age, I decided I didn't want to spend all day worrying about my tinnitus. I'm going to get back to my family, friends, and the hobbies I like to do and just move on. That's the secret, ladies and gentlemen. Many people can do it on their own. And if you can't, there's help available through the behavioral therapies. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the story. Interesting. Do you see patients ever who have it with the spikes in their tinnitus? They have, it, we have a patient that asked about jumpy vision and said that when this, when the tinnitus spikes, then their vision gets jumpy as well. Is there, I know you talked a little bit about vision as in, in line with it, but. That is unique. No, I'm not really familiar with that type of, of, of symptom relationship. Um, you know, without getting too deep medically and stuff, probably want to get a neurology exam, you know, maybe mm -hmm. get the MRI, that kind of thing, get the audiogram, of course. But once all of those tests are obtained and, and hopefully they're all normal and negative, I don't know what else I could really offer at that point. Okay. Well, we have a ton of comments on our Facebook page, but it's basically people talking about their experiences. People seem very grateful for the, um, for the information that you've given them. Um, but I don't have any more questions right now that I can ask. So I think that, um, I think you've covered everything. Wonderful. It's been a real pleasure. It was a pleasure you. having you. Yeah. I appreciate everything. Okay. We really are grateful for you taking the time today and, and, uh, and talking to us about this. It's not easy actually to find people who will talk about it. And so some of the comments on, on the Facebook page were saying, you know, thank you for, for validating, um, what I'm experiencing and that sort of thing. So that is that seems to really mean a lot too. So we appreciate you being here. You're most welcome. I wanna thank everybody who um, attended this afternoon and thank you for taking the time to be with us today. Uh, we are recording the webinar and it will be in our video library uh, later this week. We'll go ahead and add captions to these captions that are here now, um, won't be on the recording. So we'll add permanent captions there. Um, if you do go to our website, please click on the Giving Tuesday graphic on our homepage to see everything that we have going on for today, um, which is Giving Tuesday. And again, I want to thank you, Dr. Piccarillo, and thank everyone for attending. Thanks so much. Okay. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Have a great day.